Well, friend, I want to just invite you to be a part of our magazine family. Prophecy in the News has done a magazine for a number of years. We have thousands of subscribers across uh, the nation and some other parts, parts of the world. This is available. A year subscription is thirty four ninety five, And the reason it's at that price is there is always uh, a special bonus offer. And you can go to our website to see what the current one is. Uh, you call the 800 number on your screen and get the information over the phone. But by paying that, you get 12 editions mailed to your home, plus you get the special bonus offers. If you only want the magazine in an electric form, electronic format and no special offer, it's $24.95 a year. But we would love for you to be part of our family. The magazine always has very timely articles. These are by some guests and authors uh, that are a part of us. I always have an article. We have feature articles from the archives of J.R. Church and outstanding articles by Bob Carnuke on archaeology. Hope you'll join our magazine family. Welcome to this edition of Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson, joined today by my good friend, Doug Woodward. Hello, brother. Hi, Kevin. How are you today? I am good, and it's Excellent. good to welcome you. Thank you. Always a privilege to be here with you. Well, we're here to talk about some uh, new things you're advancing, and uh, you put them together in, in really a presentation and um, a book now called The Next Great War in the Middle East. Yes, yes. It's uh, uh, kind of continuing an, uh, an area of research and writing that I've been doing really for the last year or so, really focusing a lot on geopolitics because I really believe that that really is the kind of classic core of Bible prophecy. You and I rely on that. We yeah, really do. And, and there's a lot of other issues that a lot of authors have written some great things about and talked about, but I feel like that with the urgency of what's going on in the world that, that we really have to focus again on the geopolitics, what's happening in Europe, what's happening in the Middle East. And, uh, and so I, I, boy, I'm looking at that every day now because so much is happening every day. Well, you know, if you take a literalist, futurist perspective of prophecy, you're going to land up Aha, no pun intended, but you're going to land back in the land. Yes. Which uh, is really the cause of all the consternation. Right. We could say this is a Jewish, um, Palestinian, Arab problem, but because they comprise a third or more of the United Nations, they've made it a global problem. Yeah. Uh, the whole, you know, issue of, of ISIS, of the, of the deal with Iran, the, the U.S., uh, the, the war, the occupation as, as it was, for almost 10 years in Iraq, the if you, issue of Afghanistan. I mean, this has been a consuming issue for our country uh, really since about the year 2000. And one could even go back to 1991. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, you could. Yeah. It, we've it, been really, we've had hands deep or elbow yes. deep in the Middle East since 91, since that first right. Gulf War. That's right. The Gulf Wars. And, and of course, today, there's so much emphasis on the terrorism that we're seeing in the Middle East. And now uh, it's here on our shores. Yeah, now it's exactly right. We had the and San Bernardino killings. Just, uh, just uh, boy, just this last week or so as we're, as we're recording this. And, and uh, it, it really is, uh, you know, a question as to what is the connection between uh, ISIS and uh, terrorist threats that we have in our country, uh, what happened in Paris just a few weeks ago. Uh, so the world is, uh, is really aflame right now with these kinds of issues. And for Christians, uh, especially those of us that are futurists, that believe that there are major prophecies yet to be fulfilled, specifically centered around the Middle East and the Holy Land, uh, it's a time to be extra vigilant. Absolutely. And I must just say here, um, I and we at Prophecy in the News observed that when, you know, the uh, blood moons concluded in September, um, there was a lot of, I, some people may, may say their blood moon deflated, mm -hmm. but ours didn't at all because I saw those not as precise dates, but as windows. Right. But amazingly enough, and precisely enough, when um, the fourth and final blood moon happened on September 28th, it was in the very next week. Yes. That as the U.S. was leaving a vacuum in Syria, Russia decides to partner in the wake of the Iran deal, to partner with Iran. That week sends troops to Iran, mm -hmm. who, and Iran is going to send troops into Syria right. to combat ISIS. And I'm watching the footprint of Russia and Syria right on the northern border of little Israel, and I'm going, okay, this looks like Gog and Magog. Yes. And Persia, if we yes. know Ezekiel 38 and 39. And right. I think that plays right into what you're yes. talking about. Yeah, that's um, uh, really the, the focus of this book, The Next Great War in the Middle East, is really looking at this whole issue of the Gog and Magog uh, battle and how might 
what's happening today, especially in the relationship between Russia and the United States, you know, how does that uh, have a bearing on what's happening? And of course, I argue that, that there are a lot of issues that have been going on behind the scenes, and one needs to understand history, both distant and recent, to get a, get a sense of what happened. You know, the Paris, for instance, the Paris terrorist attacks, those are not random events. They are, they are precipitated based upon things that have been going on in the Middle East now for really about four years intensely, since 2011, the timing of the Arab Spring, so-called, um, and just really the positioning between the United States and Russia relative to what's happening in the Middle East with Syria being especially a focal point because Syria has been the long-term ally of Russia and it appears from most experts perspective that the U.S. has been out to get Bashar al-Assad, the, the so president of Syria, for at least those last four years and, uh, and that really comprises the conflict that's going on right now in, uh, in that area of the world. Well. Um, our guest is Doug Woodward, and we're talking about the next great war in the Middle East. I, I would like to uh, bring the relevant scripture passage into this. Please. We're talking about, folks, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, we will not take the time to read all of these verses because you have a copy of God's Word, I trust, and you can see these. But uh, just the beginning of the prophecy, if I may, um, Ezekiel 38, verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And then, Doug, of course, he lists some of the partner nations. Right. Persia, which is modern Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all of his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared. And prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Mm. So, right. Um, it is let definitely, me yeah. The, ask you to take that forward. Sure. <laughs> let's, we'll jump in. It's uh, all these names are very strange sounding names to uh, to for most folks, for people that have been students of Bible prophecy, as most of our viewers will have been for quite some time. They're familiar sounding names. Uh, the debate that's emerged in the last, oh, I'd say last decade, certainly, mm -hmm. but probably even more in the last five or six years. Who are those nations referring to, those tribes of peoples that are, you can go all the way back to Genesis 10 to sort of pick them up in terms of the, the descendants of the three sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And of course, many of them really come from the line of Japheth. And uh, the issue is where they settled. Did they settle just in, the, the, in Turkey, which is where uh, many of the new, more popular prophecy authors are pointing to? They're saying, well, Gog is, uh, as I jokingly say, Gog is just a Turk. Uh, uh -huh. But the, the reality is that as one looks at and studies the tribes and their movements, and that's, of course, part of what I do in the book is, is revisit some of the classic studies of, uh, of this issue of identifying who these nations are and where they are located. One quickly understands that we're not just talking about the area sort of between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, which is sort of where Magog was located, or Meshach and Tubal, which are sort of the east and the west of Turkey, mm -hmm. and Anatolia, as it was used to be, used to be known but that we're really dealing with the Eurasian area, everything from the Ukraine across the top of India all the way to China. Large and area. That, a very large area. And that uh, even, you know, as Chuck Messler says in one of his studies from years ago, uh, that the walls of China, the Great Wall, was really known as the Wall of Gog. It was uh -huh. a wall built to keep Gog out of China. So we know that Certainly Josephus and other scholars talk about Gog and Magog. Uh, a lot of the pictures and words of horses and bows and arrows and so forth all relate to, uh, to like things like Genghis Khan, uh, who may not have been Chinese looking, right. but might have been a Turkmen, you know, and, uh, and yet spread uh, really across the whole, what are known as the Asian steppes. 
uh, the stands, as I call them, Kyrgyzstan and right. uh, Turkmenistan and Afghanistan and Pakistan and so on. So it, it looks the most uh, scholars going all the way back to even Wilhelm Jacinius back in the 19th century that predicted that the, this final great power we call Gog would be Russia. Right. And, and Justinius was yes. a Hebrew scholar. He was his a, lexicon, absolutely, yes. He, he solidly, and I believe it was in the 1850s or yes. earlier. It was I, published posthumously in about 1850. He, uh, he nailed it as, he as, did. as Russia. Yes, he did. He said Rosh is, and he showed relationships um, to uh, different writings by uh -huh. different ancient scholars and so forth, uh, Jewish as well as Christian, that tied this back in to the whole point of what I said, Eurasia. And so there are a lot of popular authors today are wanting to say, no, it's just Turkey. They're wanting to speculate that the Antichrist is, in fact, uh, his power base is Turkey, uh, that the Antichrist will be Islamic. Uh -huh. These are all possibilities. These are all scenarios. But it's also very conceivable that just as good brother Hal Lindsey originally sort of put forth in around 1970 in the late great planet Earth, and we're, when we're talking Gog and Magog, we're talking about Russia. Yep. And as we look, and this is really what I do in the first half of this new book, is I really zero in on the geopolitical uh, discussions that are going on. And one of the things I've always done in my books is I try to cite secular authorities, yes. not just folks that agree with me about right, futurism right. and prophecy. So you'll see me quote uh, articles from Bloomberg, the New York Times, even the Council on Foreign Relations, you know, the right. study groups, the Institute for the this Study is of good War. Though. This is yeah, good. so you, I you pull all these things together, compile these things, and then do some assessment. What does this tell us about what's going on? What are the root causes behind the conflict uh, in the Middle East? And I got to tell you, the conclusion, virtually all the experts say, it's ultimately a proxy war between Russia and the United States. Uh -huh, I would agree, and your word proxy sums it up well. Mm. Folks, we're talking with Doug Woodward about his new book, and I want to just mention this. This is uh, really uh, quite a piece of scholarship, and uh, Doug feels that it's a message that God has not only given him, but is really vital for this hour. It's called The Next Great War in the Middle East. It's full of documentation. Um, by the way, this is... Uh, going to be available right now. Yes, I believe. it's going to be available. Right That's right. And uh, you can get this through prophecyinthenews.com or calling the 800 number on your screen. And we're offering this for 1995 plus shipping and handling. Mm -hmm. But we also want to include what this sort of sprang out of. Yes. And that was your other work. Is Russia destined to nuke the U.S.? Right. It's the proxy war again. Yes. And uh, this too is 1995. You get uh, the book really a uh, booklet, but it's got a lots large pages and it's lots about of 20, information. 000, about 20,000 words, so 20, it's about half words. of a book, basically. Yeah. And then we're putting in um, a CD wrong with wrong. this, and mm -hmm. it's got an interview with Josh Peck of two hours on mm -hmm. details of this, five articles that elaborate mm -hmm. that are not in this book, mm -hmm. and then the presentation you did at our prophecy conference of 82 slides yes. to give this information. Those together are 1995 plus shipping and handling, or you can get the whole package for thirty six ninety five plus shipping and handling, yes. all right? Yes. We just have to remind you to use the 800 number on your screen or go to our website at prophecyofthenews.com. But I really want to get back to uh, the subject matter, mm. mm -hmm. a proxy war. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> so we're over in the footprint of the Middle East, but the United States is implied and involved. Right. Uh, we don't have that much time. It's flying by as we're talking. Right, but right. Let's try to explore the failures of uh, U.S. policy that have yeah. created this mm -hmm. and why this animosity toward the U.S. And does Russia, and this is a lot, yes. does Russia really have the uh, military capability right. to equal the U.S.? Yes. Yeah, well, we could definitely have a two-hour program I know, uh, on I know. this. And so, but it, it, it is, I, these are issues I cover in depth. And what I do try to do is not just give my opinion, I do my analysis, but I gather the facts from all these secular sources that are looking at what created the sort of entry point or the power vacuum in the Middle East that caused Russia to come in. And it really was, in, in my opinion now, it was an assessment, it's my assessment, is that it was the decision on the part of the U.S. to basically pull entirely all of its troops out of Iraq, 
uh, this created a, a vacuum in which uh, Prime Minister Maliki essentially went right back to the old Shia yep. versus Sunni thing. Right. And so uh, initially we were dealing from 2011 to about 2013 with a, a reemergence of the insurgency that we defeated. Call it a civil war in yeah, Syria. Yeah, it, it re-emerged again and it was, uh, it was flamed on because of Maliki's um, basically warfare and terrorism by the state against the Sunnis in western Iraq. The Sunnis really were uh, creating, they were actually kind of uh, getting integrated into Al-Qaeda and then from Al-Qaeda really by about 2014 you saw ISIS emerge. Well ISIS really mm -hmm. was Al-Qaeda uh, combining the Sunnis and many of the Ba'athist military leaders that were essentially kicked out of Iraq. If anyone saw Some the movie. Some of the Revolutionary Guard. Yes, perhaps. exactly. Yeah. So you had this sort of collection and that really comprised what we know as ISIS. And so ISIS decided to, rather than just be an Al-Qaeda, sort of a stateless terrorist group, they would create the caliphate or the state sort of in that no man's land between Baghdad and, uh, and Damascus. And that's really where ISIS has centered. And I like to point out, and you may mention it in the book, forgive me for not knowing because I haven't read all the chapters yes. yet. It's just out. <laughs> yes. But, um, you know, our president always refers to ISIL. Yes. Which is the Islamic State of... Uh, the Levant. Ir yeah, Iran and Levant. Levant, yes. Which actually is a middle age term, mid it medieval is. term, yeah. that implies a caliphate with no presence of Israel at all. That's correct. So when he says ISIL, instead of ISIS, he's saying no Israel. There, there's a message there. You know? And I would say our power vacuum, as you described it, yes. was really precipitated by a leadership vacuum in the White House of the United States. Yeah, not to get too political, but you know, I, I certainly don't shy away from going into that. In fact, there's many secular sources that I cite that, that are very critical, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not just talking about the conspiracy theorists, we're talking about very uh, noteworthy, you know, New York Times, right. Bloomberg, The Daily Beast, whatever. They point out that the White House has actually not been in agreement with the CIA and the Pentagon related, related to what foreign policy should in fact be put in place in that area of the world. And it, it's coming out, you know, quite recently here that uh, the military information that was fed to the White House was actually doctored. Yes, there's always that. The intelligence. I mean, that, that has been a notorious issue that's gone on in America intelligence really since the 1950s. Uh -huh. And it's because of politics, it's because of career building and all those kinds of things. But you, know, you really look at what led to this situation, it really was the decision on the part of the White House that they, they did not believe that we should be engaged in wars in the Middle East. Uh, people might really wonder why in the world do we do this deal with it with Iran? Well, the the answer to that, and it's very well documented, and I talk about it a good deal in the book. It's because the the Obama administration has decided that the Shia, led by Iran, is the most stabilizing influence. Think about that for a moment. The most stabilizing influence in the Middle East, and that we should bet on Iran and not Saudi Arabia not Israel, not Jordan. We should, we should basically empower the Shia to allow them to manage and monitor the Middle East. That's so uh, scary. It's scary, but it is, it is the, the philosophy, the policy behind the U.S. strategy so-called. I would certainly say that the whole Middle East really in modern times unraveled when the Iranian Revolution happened in 1979. Certainly. Under President Carter. Right when really those extreme ideologues came to power, right. Ayatollah Khomeini. Oh yes, and yeah, it depends on how far you want to go back in yeah. history. You can go back to colonialism of the, of the English, the French, mm -hmm. the, you know, and even the Americans to some extent. Yes. You can go back to the way Churchill divvied up the Middle East mm -hmm. and partitioned it right after World War I. And there's a lot of anger and, and animosity. This goes back to the whole sykes pico agreement, you know, back in 1916. Yeah. And so the roots are 100 years old that are, that are really, uh, you know, a fire today. 
And that's the perspective that I try to bring. And then to bring it into the whole issue of Gog and Magog yeah. and why I believe this is the next great war. The next great war, I believe, is Gog and Magog. However, um, where I go beyond this is some of the work that I've done with some of my other colleagues, the Final Babylon, for instance, really looking at is America actually encoded in uh, the Bible? Is it in Jeremiah 50 and 51? Is it actually encoded in Ezekiel 38 and 39? And so I take a position which is kind of new, and it might get me in some trouble okay, with some people. Let's hear it. Yeah, which is that, that in the passage, uh, Ezekiel 38, 10 through 13, that talks about uh, the land of unwalled villages. Right. And I, it's in that section where we also read about um, Sheba and Dedan, which is Saudi Arabia and Arab Emirates and that whole area. Now we've always read those uh, phrases and thought, okay, yes. when is Israel at peace? When How, is when Israel at peace? When can this thing time out? When are they living in but peace gonna, and security? You're going to take that a different direction. That's right. And it, it's too complex to, to do on a TV program uh, of this duration. But essentially, if one goes in and studies the, the, the key word, is a Hebrew word betash, which really relates to safety, security, security uh, and the number of times it's used in the Old Testament. Uh, most of the time, five, I think it's like about six sevenths of the time, whatever that decimal mm -hmm. point is, it's, it's really used uh, in, a, in a very positive sense of God promising through a covenant with Israel that he will bring them back to the land in the last days and he will provide them security. But then there's also about half a dozen places where it's used as a pejorative, it's used as a criticism. But interestingly, it's always used that way against the opponents of God. It's not used with that Israel. way, correct, not with Israel. It's used that way as against the daughter of Babylon, against the Ethiopians, okay. against the Danites, against the merchants of Tyre. And so they are always the opponents of God. The only place, and this is so interesting, where uh, scholars are saying, and this is why they've, they've said, well, we're, the unwalled villages are Israel, is they understand that it can be interpreted pejoratively, and so they imply that or impose that on that one passage. If so, and this is the point I make, it's the only place in the Bible where a promise for Israel to live safely would be a pejorative. Ergo, my conclusion is it isn't referencing Israel at all. So you would argue it has another application? It has another application, that there is another land of unwalled villages. Israel, of course, and I argued this this last summer, uh, and I talk about this in Is Russia Destined to Nuke the U.S.? Uh, Israel is a land that has walls. It has 417 miles of walls separating them from uh, the threat of the Palestinians. So it is a land of walled villages, Indeed. bars and gates and so forth. But what is the biggest, most notorious land that is unwalled? Well, it would be in the New World and it would be the United States. And Even I more out, so since our immigration is so low. That's lax. right. You talk I'm about sure that's unwalled. not really yeah. in the mind when we talk here, that's but that's right. where my mind went. That's right. And so this issue of peace and security, you know, we're running out of time, but essentially this is, this is a, a big point in why it connects in with the merchants of Tarshish, right. the young lions, Sheba and Dizan. That verse 13 of chapter 38 has always been looked at as a lame protest. You know, that we just sort of say, oh, well, gee, you know, what are you doing, Russia or God? You're attacking Israel. And so we just sort of we ignore just sort it. Of, uh, we take it from that point of view. What I've been uh, positing, what I've been proposing for the last six months or so is, wait a second. One can also read that as these nations, the merchants of Tarshish, we argue, is the United States. Okay. The colonies, the young lions, the colonies of Britain and so forth. We argue that that, that passage is referencing the United States and that it's the United States that is dwelling carelessly, that is actually looking at what Gog is doing, and it's saying, why are you attacking us? Because it also says at the beginning in the King James Version, it says, in reference to the attack of Gog and Magog, it says, also, at the same time, mm -hmm. an evil thought will come into your mind to essentially go up against the land of unwalled villages. And then in that same passage, it talks about Sheba and Didan, the merchants of Tarshish, and its young lions. Well, there even seems to be some divine uh, force involved because maybe against their better judgment because the scripture says that uh, God says, I put my hook in your mouth. 
Yes, and so draws even, it in. A, a Ryan, yes. So he's actually, maybe some are saying, is this such a really good idea? Right. Now, our time is fast collapsing. Right, but, uh, right. We're, folks, we're talking with Doug Woodward, uh, uh, university teacher, scholar, writer, uh, much, much study in this area. The question I have that we really haven't touched on, mm -hmm. is uh, Russia have the mi military yes. capability to seriously right. do damage to the United States. Yes, well, we, well sometime we'll have to do another program just to focus on that because the answer is yes. And this is what's very, very disturbing is that in the last few years, the White House has said, remember they called ISIS the JV of Al Qaeda? Oh yeah. Yeah, well they also called Russia just a regional power. Yeah, I remember that. Right, but the, the situation is that in the last few years, Russia has brought many of their weapons up to parity and probably up, up to, standard up to of the ours. same standard yeah. as ours. And they actually have certain kinds of weapons that we don't have. And it all boils down really to this. The, the single biggest deterrent that we have historically had against a first strike from Russia is comprised in a single word, consequences. And if there are Absolutely. no consequences for a Russia first strike, then Russia would have done a first strike by now, long ago. Right. But the, the policy known as Mutual Assured Destruction, MAD, mm -hmm. which was proposed by Kennedy and McNamara in the 1960s, uh, which really came out as a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Essentially, the issue today is that the one thing that the Russians have that the U.S. does not have is a deterrent. Russia has deployed 11,000 anti-ballistic missiles around their country. They are protecting themselves against a counterstrike. If Russia, and here's what it boils down to in, in a simple couple of sentences. Give me about 20 seconds. That's right. Russia <laughs> can strike the U.S. The U.S. cannot absorb the first strike and strike back. Because if the U.S. attempts to strike back, Russia can defeat those missiles because they have such an overwhelming number of anti-missile missiles. And so they're ABMs. So they, na they now have the Star Wars defense. They have, in effect, th they do have. And we could talk another time about how this technology works and why it is so superior and why we are at great risk. And that's why I wrote this book. I think America is at great risk right now. And uh, most Americans do not know that. This is an arresting, uh, arresting line of thought. We've been talking to Douglas Woodward. His book is The Next Great War in the Middle East saying that uh, the, the great threat is that Russia, uh, working through Iran and Syria, will actually bring forward a nuclear attack on the United States by proxy. What's this have to do with you and I? Well, it has a lot to do with us. If we know the Lord, first of all, uh, have no fear, we'll be fine. If we don't know the Lord, it's a very frightening world we're living in. And if you don't know Christ, you need to call on his name. He died for you and rose again first for your spiritual problem, and then to give you an eternal home in heaven. Folks, let's keep looking up. He's surely coming back.